Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vineyardchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. Now here's this week's message. Oh, cool. Five bucks. What the? That's so weird. I thought I heard something. You did. You know what you should do? You should go and treat yourself to a frappuccino. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. What you really need to do is save for college your kids. College for okay, your kids. Okay, okay. Wait. Actually, you really need to be donating to charity, attending a uh. Well, welcome to Vineyard Community Church. I'm so glad you're here with us today. Uh, our awesome senior pastors, Pastor Andy and Sharon Mead, have given me the opportunity to kick off our brand new series called Money Talks. Come on, man. Now, real fast, before you say to yourself, oh, man, I knew it. I finally come to church, and they're talking about taking my money. I knew it. Or maybe you have that family member, that friend that finally came to church, and you're like, oh, why did I bring them this week when they're talking about money? They need to hear about Jesus. Their life is crazy. Hey, don't worry, because our topic is money, but our message is always Jesus. It's always Jesus. See, but we got to talk about it, because money does talk. You know, money talks a lot. See, and, and my money talks, and the main thing my money says to me is bye-bye. You know, that's what it says to me. Another thing my money says to me all the time is, I love your wife and the way she spends me. You know, and, and all of our money probably says this to us. All of our money probably says, go to Target, buy everything you have no need for, and just buy it and justify it because you think you need it. You know, money talks. It says a lot. And one of the main things that, that money says is serve me. Money says serve me. Now, if you are taking notes today or following along on your outline, or you, you can even live tweet to at Vineyard VA, you can title part one of this series, Serve Me. Serve Me. Now, I have a story in the Bible I want to read to you. Then we'll come back to it a little later in the message. Check this out in Matthew 14, starting on verse 14. It says this. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As the evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it is getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the village and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We, only, we here only have five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves, and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people, and they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. So if you add the women and children, that's roughly 20,000 people. Jesus feeds 20,000 people with the number one special from Captain D's. You know, this is a crazy miracle. This is insane what he does here. Which leads me to my tweetable thought. My tweetable thought today is this. Money talks and says, serve me. God talks and says, trust me. Who do you follow? At Vineyard VA. And you can post that on our social media and get the conversation started online. You know, who do you follow? Because money can talk, but so does God. God talks. Now, I remember one time in my life where I definitely listened to money over God in common sense, too. But now, my wife and I, we went on a cruise. It was about two years ago. We went on a cruise on our honeymoon. And um, we went to a cruise on the, to the Bahamas. Come on. It was great. Uh, and it was shopping day, right? We, we went to the Bahamas. We're going to go shopping. We're going to the marketplace. And my goal was to buy my, my wife a real, an authentic, a real 
Michael Kors or Coach Purse. You know, that was my goal. That's why I wanted to get her. You know, so this is my mission. So we're going to the different shopping areas. I don't see anything. She doesn't see anything that she likes. And finally, we're like, man, it's getting late. Let's head back to the boat. So we're on our way back. And then as we're heading back, we see this woman holding a sign that says, authentic Michael Kors and Coach Purse is for sale. And I'm like, man, this is a sign from the heavens, man. So me and Aaron, we walk up to the woman, and, we, and she doesn't really speak a lot of English. She was just like, come follow her. So we looked at each other. We said, all right, we'll follow her. And we're walking, and all of a sudden, this woman, she starts speed walking in this place. Like, man, why is she walking so fast ahead of us? So she's like a good distance ahead of us, and we're trying to keep up. And then as she's walking, I notice she's getting away from the shopping area. I'm like, okay, you know. And then all of a sudden, she takes this left turn down the street, and Aaron looks at me, and she has this concerned face, and she's like, uh, I don't think we should follow her. And then I just looked at her, and I said, hey, we just spent all that money on the wedding. Well, we spent all your parents' money on the wedding, but I did buy you that ring, and, and we did move into that condo. We got a whole living room set, you know, and I paid for this trip. We're broke, Aaron. We're broke. This is our one opportunity to, give, to get you an authentic, high-quality Michael Kors or Coach Perks. We got to go. We got to follow her. So we keep following her, right? And Aaron's now taking a couple steps behind me because she's concerned, but I'm walking. I'm trying to keep up with this woman. Then I can't make this part up. Then the woman takes another turn down an alleyway. And I'm like, oh, man, you know, maybe I shouldn't. But I, I follow her, and then I see her walking up these stairs uh, down this alleyway. And at the top of the stairs is this big dude, huge guy, just sitting on the chair by a door that the woman just walking in. And I'm thinking to myself, I look at Aaron, I look around, don't really see anybody. And I'm thinking to myself, am I on the set of Taken 4 right now? Is Liam Neeson about to come and save me? Because I don't know. So I have this moment where I see this big man, I see the stairs. I'm thinking about, man, I really want to buy my wife something nice. So I walk up the stairs and I keep going. And with each step, I'm thinking, man, Jacob, you are dumb. You are dumb for real. Why are you really walking up these stairs? And I finally, I get to the top. I look at the big man. He looks at me. He makes this like, ugh, noise and opens the door. And then I, I, I peek my head in. And it's a room filled with a whole bunch of purses and, and people and Americans. I was like, okay, I felt a lot better after that. So we, get, we go in. We buy her a real purse. It was real, I promise. And, it, you know, it, and it's nice. Hey, don't do that. That was real dangerous. But, but hey, money talks, right? Money will make us do things that, we, that we're thinking to ourselves. Why would we ever do that? So sometimes it's so easy to listen to money. See, it's easy to listen to what the world tells us, that we have to get things and gain things and have things so we can be better. See, money can consume our lives. You know, if you're rich, you're thinking to yourself, oh, I got to get richer. If you're poor, you're thinking to yourself, how can I get rich? You know, money talks a lot. But here's the truth. There's nothing wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with money at all. You know, by, by a show of hands in here, who in here has ever had the thought, Man, I wish I had a lot of money. Yep. And for everyone who didn't raise your hand, we have a prayer team right here that I'd love to stand with you and pray with you because you just lied in church right now. See, there's nothing wrong with money at all. We need money. And here's the reason why. Because money can provide for our present needs. Money can provide for our future needs. And money, guess what, can provide for the needs of people all around us. See, money is not evil. One of the most misquoted verses in the Bible is about money. It comes from 1 Timothy 6.10. It says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, it's the love of money. A lot of people like to say just money is the root of all evil. But no, it's, it's this phrase, the love of money, which is the Greek word. If you look at the Greek word for love of money, it's pronounced philagaria, which sounds a lot like margarita, because if you have too much of those, you'll waste a lot of money too. But, but this phrase is a deep desire for wealth or money, no matter what the cost will be. I'm going to do anything I can to get what I want. See, check this out. Check out what Jesus says. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24, he says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will 
hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You can't serve both of them. Now, why does he say God and money? Why doesn't he say you can't serve both God and your job? Or why did he say you can't serve both God and your favorite hobby or habit? Or why doesn't he say you can't serve both God and LeBron James? Because that would be weird, I guess. You know, but he says God and money. Now, now why is this? Colossians 3, 5 says this. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual morality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. Check this out. Which is idolatry. Now, what is idolatry? Idolatry is simply you putting something first in your life where God is supposed to be. See, I'm going to tell you this. When you put God first in your life, everything falls into place. But our society and our world tells us, hey, you got to put money first. You got to put things first. You got to put status first. Then you'll be okay. Then you'll have what you want. Greed is idolatry. And greed simply means I want more and more and more no matter what. This feeling, or this feeling of needing more and getting more no matter what. And money, which takes such a high place in our country especially, you know, it can represent a lot of things to, to different people. Money can represent comfort, power, control, but even money can represent getting the medicine that you need. Money can represent having food for your kids or the proper school supplies. See, that's why I say money is not evil or bad. It's a tool. It's a tool that God gives us that we can, that we can use. But very easily in our culture, it can go from in God we trust to in money we trust. If only I have more money, if only I do this, then I'll be okay. See, but friends, I don't think God sent his one and only son to die on a cross for us just to be wealthy. I believe that God has a purpose for us, that God has life for us, that God has promises for us. See, money talks and it says, serve me, get me, you need more of me. God talks and says, trust me, you need more of me, get what I have. Now I have a story in the Bible I want to read to you that's about trusting God and following him with everything that we have. So here we have the prophet Elijah and, there's, and God sends him to this pagan land that's in the middle of a great drought. And check this out. This is what happens in 1 Kings 17. It says this. It says, Sometime later the brook dried up because there, were, there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went there. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, why would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As, as she was going to get it, he called out, Anne, bring me a piece of bread. Please bring me a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. Only a handful of flour and a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat and die. Now that's a pretty intense story. That's, that's pretty crazy. And here you go. Here's this man of God. You know, he, he tells this woman to bring him some bread and water. So this woman, life has not been good to her. She's a widow. Her husband is dead. And that culture, that means she doesn't have a lot of value. She doesn't have anyone who's really supporting her. Based on how the story goes, her son, who would be next in line to take care of her, must be a small boy. So she's gathering, she's, a, she's gathering sticks. There's this drought going on. And, and there's, not a lot, there's not a lot of good things happening for her. And we see her. She's on her way. And, and she's gathering sticks because she's about to make her famous stick stew. Life is not good for her. See, my, for, my first point today is this. Where we see sticks, God sees an opportunity to demonstrate his power. See, where we see sticks, God sees an opportunity to demonstrate his power. See, she was gathering up sticks to make some stick stew. Now, I've been hungry before, but I've never been stick stew hungry. That's a whole new kind of hungry, right? See, we, we may, you may be in here and you're like, man, I'm not stick stew hungry. 
but you've had some circumstances in your life, you had some seasons in your life where you look around and all you see is sticks. You see nothing more than sticks. You look at your marriage, looks like sticks. You, look, you see your job, looks like sticks. You look at your dreams, sticks. Finances, sticks. Everything around us is looking like sticks. And here comes this man coming out of nowhere. She doesn't know him. They never met before. And it's a drought. And when there's a drought going on, a drought's kind of like a I'm going to do me and you do you boo-boo kind of season. You don't, you don't mess around with people and ask people for things when the drought's going on. And here comes this man. He's asking for some bread and for some water. And if I was this woman, I would have to think to myself, this man has to be out of his mind. Didn't I just tell you that that I'm making some stick stew, and I'm about to go home and die, and you asking me for some bread and water. But, but check out what Elijah says back to her. Check out what Elijah says back to her. In 1 Kings 17, it says, Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And in the Bible, when it's always filled with this phrase, don't be afraid. And it seems to come at the beginning of something bad and in the middle of something that God's doing and is God going to come through. There's this phrase, don't be afraid. And I wonder why it's in the Bible. And maybe because the Bible is a living word that God is still active. Maybe God keeps using this phrase, this phrase because life throws things at us that we're afraid of, that we're fearful of. That causes us to feel insecure or concern or worry. And I'm going to tell you this right now. God is saying, don't be afraid. Just because you're at the beginning of uncertainty doesn't mean that God's faithfulness will change. He is still good. Don't be afraid. See, because where we see sticks, God sees the opportunity to demonstrate his power. God sees the opportunity to do something in our life. Elijah continues. He says, go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. See, but where, where she just saw sticks, God saw the little bit she had. And with faith and trust in him, it can turn into a demonstration of his power. I just got a little bit of flour. I just got a little bit of olive oil. I just got some sticks. And you want a piece of bread? And then on top of that, you're telling me that if I trust you, I'll have food for me and my son? See, I think this is a great picture of the tension that we face every day, especially when it comes to money. Especially when it comes to money. The truth is this, the woman has supplies, she had flour, she had olive oil. Olive oil in that time actually was worth a lot of money. See, the issue that she had was different than the issue that she said. See, the issue that she had was way different than the issue that she said. See, the issue that she had was that she has some things, that she has some supplies, but there's a drought going on. And what happens if my supplies runs out and I don't have enough for tomorrow? See, she said she didn't have anything and she was just going to go home and make some sticks too. But that wasn't true. She has some things, but she was afraid that she won't have it the next day. So the truth is, she is saying, I mean, I trust God for today, but what happens if the drought is still going on? And God doesn't come through tomorrow. I trust God a little bit, but not with everything. And my money is telling me I got to hold on to that. I got to get that right before I can do anything else. But Elijah says to her, yeah, you go home and do what you said and be negative and be doubtful and look at your sticks. But while you're doing that, do also what God tells you to do. See, I love this too because she was negative and she was doubtful. But did you know just because you're negative and you're doubtful, that doesn't stop God from being good in your life? That God still wants to take care of you? That God still wants to come through for you? And your, and your posture and your attitude may be doubtful and negative, but God still wants to show his goodness in your life? See, don't think for a second that our negativity can stop what God is doing. 
God is always up to something. See, he says, just do what God has told you to do and make me a piece of bread with what you have. And there's two things I want to highlight here about this bread that he keeps asking for. The first thing is this. The Bible says in John 6, 35, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Jesus says, he is the bread of life. Check this out. In Luke 17, 6, Jesus says this. Jesus replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this tree, be uprooted, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. See, he said with a little bit of faith, you can do extraordinary things. So Elijah is telling this woman, if you just have a little bit of faith, and if you give a little bit of bread, you'll see how God will provide for you beyond your imagination, beyond your expectations. It's kind of like he's saying with the bread of life, when you have Jesus and just a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of faith is more beneficial and more powerful than all the wealth in the world. See, even though you just see sticks all around you, God is actually saying just with a little bit of me, I'm ready to do something bigger than you ever imagined. God takes care of our needs. God provides for us. God is the one who is in control. And the woman is like, no, nah, this is my stuff. I got I to gotta keep holding on to this. This is my supplies. And she's postured like this, holding on to her things. And the issue is this. When we're postured like this, holding on, we can't open our arms to receive all that God has for us. The more we're like this, the more it stops God from putting things in our hands. See, we got to posture ourselves different. The story continues. It says she went away and did as Elijah told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman in her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry. In keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. So God shows up. God moves in a powerful way. God does something spectacular for this woman. God demonstrates his power. See, point one today is this, where we see sticks, God sees an opportunity to demonstrate his power. My second and final point today is this, God is our provider. God is our provider. See, God comes through for this woman. He gives her more and more. But then the Bible says this, and it's crazy because the Bible always is filled with these but then moments. Something good is happening. God's moving. God's doing great things. God's up to something but then. And I don't know about you, but I've had some but then moments in my life too. God, you're moving. God, you're up to something. God, I see you working on my behalf but then this happens, but then that happens, but then I'm going through this, and you may be in here right now, or you may be watching online, and you're thinking to yourself, I'm in a but then moment right now. I'm in a but then season in my life right now. Things are going good, but then this happened. And this is what happens to this woman. Life is going good, but then. 1 Kings 17, 17 says, Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse, and he finally stopped breathing. Her son dies. What happens when we're trusting God, but then things still go wrong? What happens when we trust God, but things actually get even worse. See, this woman, she lived in a pagan land, and she probably didn't know the God that Elijah knew until Elijah came. And then she saw God. She saw God move in her life in an amazing way. So she began to trust this God. She began to hope in this God. She began to put her faith in this God. And she saw God move in her life, but then her son dies. First her husband and now her son. Now she has no one to take care of her. This woman, based on the conditions that have happened to her, she is potentially on the road to homelessness. She doesn't have much value now. See, and the interesting thing to me is this. 
Because Jesus says, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve both God and money. Because you'll be devoted to one, you despise the other. You'll love one, but hate the other. And in this moment, this woman is probably thinking to herself, I wanted to serve God, but this happened. And maybe you're in here, or you're listening online, and you're thinking to yourself, I've wanted to serve God, but this happened. And you know you're this. I wanted to serve God, but this happened. And if God is love, and if God is God, and if God is good, then why this? Then why did this happen to my marriage? Why did this happen to my family? Why did this happen to my kids? Why did this happen at work? Why am I stuck like this. And I'm going to tell you this because the world will say your God is not good. And the world will say you got to take care of yourself. But friends, it's in our lowest moments when we have to trust God the most. It's when we have to look up the most. See, this woman, God provided for her during the drought. God came into her life in a way that she never thought of. So in this moment, should she look back and say, man, God doesn't love me. God doesn't care for me. Or should she look back and see how God took care of her back then, how God provided for her back then, that that must mean that God will come through for her today, that God will provide for her tomorrow. Because it's when things aren't going the way we want, it's when we got to look back and say, I know my God is good. I know my God is faithful because I was going through that, but I got through it. And I'm going through this, but I'm going to get through it because God is for me. And if God is for me, who shall be against me? My God is bigger and greater. See, so check this part. So Elijah takes the boy. He prays over him on behalf of the woman. He takes him to the upper room and he lays him on a mat. And then the Bible says he stretches on him three times which this is a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do for us. See, see, Jesus came down to earth, and then he picked up our broken promises, our dead dreams, and then Jesus lifted them up to a higher place, and then Jesus laid himself down, and he laid in that grave for three days. But guess what? On the third day, he got back up again. He defeated death, and he defeated the grave. So I'm going to tell you this. Because he has the victory, we share in his victory with them. The Bible says, The Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to the mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is true. God provided for her. Now, you remember that story I started off with? Jesus feeds 20,000 people with the number one special from Captain D's. But not Long John Silver's, because that, that place is gross. Don't go there. See, the Bible says that the people were hungry. Jesus told the disciples to go feed them. And they're like, we don't have enough food to feed them. Jesus told, then, the, then the disciples said, the amount of money it will take to feed all these people would be at least eight months worth of money. See, money isn't necessarily good. And money isn't evil. It's neutral. It's a tool that God can use. The disciples said they don't have enough money. And Jesus says to them, do you serve money or do you trust me? Bring the bread over to me. Bring this bread. And imagine, just imagine for a second you're one of the disciples, right? And you look in this field and you see 20,000 people. And, and, and Jesus is like, here, here's your bread. You go ahead. You take over that side. There's about, mm, about 3,000 over there, 4,000. You got this? Go ahead and do it. 
Now, imagine being one of the disciples. If I was one of the disciples, I'd be thinking to myself, man, <sighs> Jesus plays too much, man. What's he talking about, man? He want me to do this, you know? <laughs> you know, my faith will be low, you know? I, just, I don't know. Then I would, go, I would go to the crowd, and I would just start breaking off little pieces, like, okay, you got a little piece for you. There you go. You know, you got a little piece. Here, another little piece for you. You know, then I see that one person like, mm, I think they on Jenny Craig. They don't need, they don't need any, any, any bread. They good, you know. But the more, the more you're going through the line, right, you're just breaking the piece. You're breaking pieces. You're breaking pieces. And then you look at your bread and you recognize it hasn't changed. My bread is still the same. And with each line, now you're just ripping off big pieces and you're passing it out and you're handing it out to people because with each line you're going down and with each time you're breaking the bread, you discover that your bread doesn't change. And it's kind of like the Bible is saying that because Jesus is the bread of life, he does not change. Where there's times and there's things that keep change, God is forever the same. And all we have to do in our moments of not understanding is keep holding on to the bread of life and keep believing in him and keep trusting him and keep hoping in him because he will remain the same. See, see, didn't, the, didn't that story start off with Elijah asking for a piece of bread. He said, just give me a piece of bread and watch what God will do. And it's like Elijah was saying, when you get the bread of life inside of you, when you trust in Jesus, he will not change. He's the same yesterday. He's the same today. And he's the same tomorrow. And he will provide for you every single day. All you got to do is keep activating faith and trusting in him and putting your hope in him. And I love how the world loves to compare money to bread, right? It says, oh, I got to make the dough. I got to make some bread. See, money will run out. Things will burn out. But the love of God will remain the same every single day until eternity because he does not change. And he's for us and with him and by him. And because of him, we can do all things. Friends, do not allow life to take away for the goodness of God. His love never fails. For the Bible declares every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. He doesn't change. His love is good. And it goes on and on. Bow your heads with me. Let's pray. God, God, we thank you for how good you are. God, we thank you for your love. You may be in here and you're thinking to yourself, I'm having a hard time trusting God because of this. Because of this thing that has happened to me. And I feel like God is saying, he took care of you before. He's going to take care of you again. I feel like God is saying, hand over this to him. There's some couples even who are struggling with finances, struggling so bad to the point where it's even coming into your marriage and breaking your marriage apart. And I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying, give your finances over to God. Trust him. Keep him first. But God is saying there's going to be financial freedom for people. Discover that you have to trust God and not your money. And there's people in here who are feeling like, man, they're in a drought. Not with food, but spiritually, emotionally, mentally, financially. You feel like you're in a drought. And just like God provided for the woman, He's going to provide for you. You may be in here and you're saying to yourself, I never trusted this Jesus you talked about, Pastor Jacob. 
but I love to today. Or maybe you have made a decision to trust Jesus before, but life got in the way. Things happen. And you're saying, I want to trust him again with my life. If that's you, right where you are in your chair, just pray this prayer with me. I'm not going to call you out or embarrass you, nothing like that. Just pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, forgive me for my mistakes. Make me new. Today, I trust you. Today, I follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. And we'll see you next week.